Hey, hello, and welcome to our audience members joining us from across the globe. I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program Deve and Development Officer here at uh, AGSIW. We have uh, yet another excellent book talk for you today, looking at a just released publication titled Art in Saudi Arabia, A New Creative Economy. Uh, which looks at the historic, <laughs> thank you, Alia, which looks at the historic and contemporary context for the recent state-led focus on art in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and we have the book's co-authors with us today. I'll introduce them here very briefly and share a link to their uh, full bios in the chat with you. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Rebecca Ann Proctor, uh, an, an independent journalist, editor, author, and broadcaster based in Dubai and Rome, from where she covers the Middle East and North Africa. She is the former editor-in-chief of Harper's Bazaar Art and Harper's Bazaar Interiors. Uh, her, write, her writing has been published in Artnet News, Freeze, The New York Times Style Magazine, Bloomberg Business Week, uh, the BBC, and AGSIW, among others. And we'll make sure to share Rebecca's latest piece uh, that she authored for us uh, in the chat, too. I'm also delighted to welcome Alia Senoussi, a globally renowned member of the contemporary art world with a focus on cultural strategy and patronage systems. She has served as Art Basel's uh, UK and Middle East and North Africa representative for over a decade and is also a senior advisor uh, for international outreach for Art Basel. Uh, in 2019, she was appointed senior advisor to the Ministry of Culture of Saudi Arabia, where she focuses on developing international partnerships while working on a variety of projects across the ministry's commissions. And moderating the session today is my colleague Kristen Smith-Diwan, senior resident scholar at AGSIW. Uh, her current projects concern generational change, nationalism, and the evolution of Islamism in the countries of the GCC. Her analysis of Gulf affairs has appeared in many publications, among them Foreign Affairs, Financial Times, and the Washington Post. Uh, and with that, Kristen, over to you. Okay. Thank you, Raymond, so much for the introduction. Um, it's particularly a pleasure to be um, talking about this book today. Um, I believe the book is, is it even available yet for uh, purchase? I'm trying to think, I saw it still, uh, it was still showing up as uh, basically you, have, you need to pre-order it at this stage. So we're getting in early on this book. Um, it's really a, a, a fantastic read, um, an extremely timely one too, looking at this, uh, incredible emergence of Saudi Arabia as a new uh, uh, location or site uh, on the art circuit, international art circuit, and thinking about some of the ways that Saudi Arabia is trying to use arts within the creative and the broader creative field to push the transformation of the, of the country. Um, as we've seen in the past few years, Saudi Arabia has made this really emphatic entry onto the global art scene uh, the launch of uh, Biennales, both for contemporary and Islamic art, uh, partnerships with notable governments, such as the French Ministry of Culture and others, um, and other um, prominent art uh, bodies, such as Desert X, for instance, to produce these kind of spectacular installations in, in Aula, and using art as really, um, planning to use art as a really key way of uh, drawing people into a number of different locations, new uh, sites and, and tourism sites within the kingdom. Um, uh, and basically also using arts, very interested in using arts and, and public means to uh, uh, draw people into the city and to engage with people in different ways. Um, our, both of our um, speakers today have, have both a long history, uh, Alia and, and Saudi Arabia, and now a, a deep current uh, engagement in, in the art scene in Saudi Arabia, which gives us an opportunity to really uh, get a picture of, of how arts have evolved in the kingdom, both before this current period and, and in this current explosion. So Rebecca, can you start just by telling us a bit about why you were drawn to the kingdom and, and some of the things you're hoping to communicate um, in this volume? Um, well, thanks again so much for having us, uh, Kristen. It's a really great pleasure to to be here. Um, I'm I'm speaking to you all from Dubai, um, where I've been living for 15 years. I'm originally from the U.S., from Connecticut, and I, when I was studying in graduate school in Paris, I was very drawn to the Middle East. Um, I was fascinated by the history, the culture, but you know there were several current events that took place that also made me interested in better understanding the social, um, you know, the social and the cultural aspects of the region that I felt at times were not always properly documented or, or understood. And I came here and I've been here ever since. Um, Saudi Arabia particularly has drawn 
has always fascinated me. I think sometimes you are fascinated by places that are not always easy to to um, to access. I mean, I am a journalist, so it, for a long time I was here and, you know, we were really interested in what was happening in Saudi Arabia in terms of art and culture. But until just a few years ago, it was very, very difficult to, uh, at least it was very difficult for me to, to travel there. Um, I first went um, in 2015. It was a very short visit to Jeddah for 2139. And then I started going regularly again in 2018, 2019. And, and since then, I've just become enraptured by this country in a state of, of complete and total change. Um, but one that I think is, is so, um, uh, is very proud and, and is working extremely hard um, in the midst of this change, this rapid change, because I've never, I've never seen a country, I mean, even the UAE go at this rate of change, but one that's also really grounded in its own, in its own history and culture that's really moving forward, um, but still trying to maintain its history and heritage. And so that's what what drew me, um, and I became a bit, in, at this, especially 2019. I remember I, I um, there was a lot, there was things were starting to move, and I just couldn't, you know, I, I kind of couldn't keep away. Every time I had a chance to go, I would go, and and I loved um, traveling the whole. I've I've been very fortunate to travel to many different regions of of the kingdom, from the north to the south. Um, you know, even Farasan Islands, um, places that some people, even Al Baha, sometimes Saudis don't even regularly go. But I loved speaking to the people and hearing their stories. Um, and so when I was approached actually by Alia to write this book um, in 2000, I think 2021, Alia, um, I, I immediately jumped at the idea because I really felt this was um, a great opportunity to to speak about this this country that is a, in a state of flux and change, but that's also greatly misunderstood often, um, but has this really important, vital, rich history, not only to the Middle East, but to the world. And that's what that's what has drawn me to this country um, ever since. Well, Ali, you have a, a kind of a long history of engagement um, as, I mean, a very prominent person within the global art scene and particularly on the scene in, in the Gulf region. Uh, the broader Middle East region and the Gulf. Um, can you tell us a bit, I mean, now you're working with the Ministry of, of Culture, I believe, uh, in Saudi Arabia, but give us a bit of a sense of how you've seen this evolution on a personal level from some of your earlier days coming into the kingdom to uh, some of the projects that you're working on now with the Ministry of Culture. So, you know, at the very beginning of my career, um, I my first uh, professional role um, in my life and in the arts uh, was a project in Siwa in Egypt. Uh, so in the desert on the border of Libya, and I of course am, am half Libyan and had lived in Egypt as a child. So it was all you know very poetic, and you know really struck me seeing the power of art to change communities that were very closed off. So Rebecca saying that about you know your interest in entry in in the kingdom early on because it was so you know, kind of this mysterious place to so many um, was also very much about my early days in the art world. And then it was, you know, right at the beginning when Sadiat Island, uh, the initiatives in Abu Dhabi were announced um, right after the Museum of Islamic Art in Qatar was opened and then Art Dubai starting. And so there was this really fervent and nascent push to look at art in the Gulf, but in a global context. And Saudi, we all, you know, knew and, and I had many dear Saudi friends um, and family members, um, you know, and, and really dear friends from university and then uh, in London who weren't necessarily yet engaged in the arts, but who all had an interest in art and culture, let's say, in a more general sense. And then also knew that Saudi actually had these incredible artistic communities but that were very grassroots. You know, these were not like, you know, there were no galleries, there were no major, of course, at all major government initiatives, but there was an understanding that there were artists in the kingdom. And, you know, that of course is the fundamental building block for a cultural scene. So then as, you know, the kind of late 2000s um, uh, and then 2010 onwards now, we've seen, of course, a much larger push by Qatar by the U in the UAE and of course, Sharjah, you know, had always had this wonderful, the museums and the uh, biennial. And you saw the international community then looking to these places and realizing that there was, um, you know, there was a dialogue to be had. And Art Dubai was a very important part of that early on, because again, you know, people were 
very nervous about even coming to visit Dubai. I mean, you can't imagine it now. I'm sure Rebecca tells us even more like Dubai is heaving with foreigners. Yeah. But, you know, I remember being asked many times, you know, in the first, even first five, six, seven years of our Dubai, um, I was a founding board member and, and helped put together, uh, put together the early days of our Dubai, the galleries, the, the visitors, the board of patrons. And people would just constantly ask like, oh, I have a Jewish last name. Can I come? Oh, can I wear a, a skirt? You know, do I have to wear, do I have to be covered? I mean, not even thinking, no, that, you know, Dubai is like, you know, kind of completely has, has no, no censorship on, on clothing and doesn't make you feel uncomfortable in any way to do so. So, you know, these were all, you know, early translations of, let's say, you know, the Middle East to a, a global world. And then, you know, you had Edge of Arabia um, was for me the big clarion call of what was happening in Saudi. And I had had the privilege of visiting Saudi just with friends when there was no Edge of Arabia, when there was no Saudi Art Council and definitely no ministry. And we went to al Ala, and we were one of the first groups of um, non-people from that region. So I was me, two other non-Saudis and 10 uh, young Saudi women. And we went to this place at the time, they called it Madan Saleh. It wasn't really referred to as al Ala. Um, and you know, it was spooky and you didn't spend the night and you heard these things about it maybe being cursed. And uh, it was just spectacular and you know, just untouched and magnificent. And uh, in the years following that, so that was uh, probably 2009 or so. And then in the years following that, you had Edge of Arabia do these yearly trips, which I helped with. And I was, again, a, a member of their um, their advisory board. Uh, and then, of course, the Saudi Art Council, which many of my dear friends uh, started and were council members of. So those were those moments when you realized there was this amazing cultural scene. It was grassroots. And of course, now it's wonderful that there is a large government push and support of the cultural scene. But what was so important was that it really just started because there was culture, there were artists. And that's so important. Yeah, I think that's one of the strengths of this book is really going back into that early history. Um, and Rebecca, you rightfully say that you can't understand Saudi Arabia's art evolution as a linear history, but that you have to understand sort of some of these um, geopolitical interruptions, um, both in terms of like oil prices and resources, but then also, of course, the the huge cultural um uh, and and political disruptions also within the kingdom. Um, and I think you're able to tell this very much too by getting into some of the early history of some of these artists. Um, and I was particularly moved by reading about some of the early uh, women that were involved in, in Saudi arts. Can you talk through some of these changes um, that Ali has discussed um, through kind of the the eyes of these artists that you that you were able to go back and interview? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think I, I think the book one of um, someone mentioned when they wrote the when they read the book, they said oh, I, they had no idea about the context, the history, um, you know, before this current, you know, culture drive or cultural revolution, as I've also referred it to, because it is quite, quite incredible um, on every level. But what I've tried, what we've tried to do is is go back. Um, I won't go as far back, but even to the to the first Saudi state, which is in the 18th century, and then kind of mentioned some of the some of the major um, points in Saudi history, you know, establishing a Saudi state, you know, and even under the Ottoman Empire, the influence of the Ottoman Empire, but then, you know, Islam um, that came into being and, um, and well, a certain, certain type of conservative Islam, obviously Wahhabism, which was quite prominent. And then the discovery of oil, which happens to the country, you know, in the in the early 20th century, um, 19, I don't want to get the date wrong, but around 1930, I think <laughs> um, it's in the book. Uh, but how all of these factors, you know, sort of this concoction of of forming, you know, a nation state and a in a in a society that was very much tribal, um, very much Bedouin, and that still exists very much, um, but also the influence of of oil and the influence of the West, because as soon as, you know, oil was 
was drilled in, in Dahran, where Saudi Aramco is today, and also where Ithra is. Ithra is a very important cultural institution, and actually, it actually is built on or, on, or extremely close to the first uh, oil well in, in the kingdom. Um, and how this has affected social life, um, you know, and with, with the discovery of oil came, you know, Western cars, Western, all sorts of shopping malls and, and influence. And, and some Saudis, uh, were, some Saudis embraced that and other people were concerned uh, with this because of course it was, there is that tug of war between maintaining your own culture and also feeling that you're influenced, you know, perhaps almost forcibly influenced by the West. Um, and so we've, I've tried to, we've tried to go through some of the, the main points, including one of the major turning points is the siege of the Grand Mosque in Mecca in 1979. And before that, you already had a, a tightening a bit of, of the society, but what many people don't realize, and, and this is where Ali and I, we converse quite a lot on, on how to represent these various voices. Um, but before 1979, this, this major turning point for the kingdom in which it really closed off to the world. Um, there was a there was quite an open society, you know, women, um, people were having, you know, art exhibitions, there was much more of a, um, yeah, it was much more open, open life than what people would would expect. Um, and there's various different uh, recounts of, of women not even being covered sometimes other times. Yes, everyone has their own story. That's what we've realized. And hence, it's difficult to completely document, um, document it, but you uh, it's it's a much more vibrant um, and creative and you know culturally culturally open society than I think a lot of people were led you know over the last few years to believe. 1979 gradually you know up until that date kind of plunged um, the country into you know very an intense period of of harsh conservative Islamic rule. Um, it's important to note also before 1979 that there was a lot of government, quite a few government sponsorships for artists. You know, artists were sent abroad to to Rome, for example, to study. Um, you know, there were some patrons of the arts. We talk about um, Mohammed uh, Farsi in Jeddah, who brought in sculptures by Henry Moore and by some of the great, you know, modern sculptures of the time to decorate Jeddah. So there was there was an art scene, um, and art was important. Um, but then what happens is, and that's exactly why I say it's not linear. I think when you study, um, when I was when I was studying in graduate school art history, you do see this, you know, linear progression of of artists, of a building of an art society, and it, and it expands and develops in a, I, I don't want to say healthy manner, but just in a more regular, um, expected manner. And here you go from development to sort of closure and this underground um, creation of art. So 1979, um, you know, we I spoke to several female artists, um, Manal Al Duane. Um, uh, Philwa Nasser, um, all of from this generation that were in school that suddenly, um, you know, at school when they were studying as kids, they were told, you know, it would be difficult to, to draw the human figure, or maybe be careful of how you represent animals. Um, anything that had life that was perhaps um, in contradiction to what Allah should be represented by, represented as. And there are few, very few places to study art as well. So, these artists walked us through um, their own, you know, experience um, during this time. Um, but then, of course, change happened. I think what's so what I love about the art history of Saudi, even during this period, is the is the incredible passion and resistance of the artists that even despite the closure and perhaps confusion as well, um, they continued to make their art and they found ways to do it. And actually, that spurred a sense of, um, in many ways, conceptual conceptual art. But you do. You do have, for example, I should mention um, Sophia Ben Zager, who who's interviewed in the book, who's one of the foremost female artists, and she had she had shows, and she was also portraying the human form, um, you know, early on in the '70s, and um, quite a few other female artists. But it just was, it was a very difficult. There were there were these difficult moments, um, and then you have this sort of. In the moment of the closure and confusion and, and also the internet, I think what's really important to mention is that, um, you know, we were counting the story, I didn't even realize that the internet came quite late to Saudi in, in late 1990s. So the Saudi Saudi creatives, you know, um, that wanted to explore or study art, they even or understand what was happening in the world, they didn't really even have that possibility until a bit later. Um, and that's around, you know, during the, the first, second Gulf War, there is, which brings me back to kind of, you know, the sort of blossomings of Edge of Arabia. Um, in the early 2000s, you get the, the Shata group, which started in, um, in Abha at this Al-Muftaha village, uh, arts village. 
And you have a few, uh, Ahmed Mater, who's one of the foremost um, Saudi artists today, Abdul Nasser Garam, um, and a few other artists were, you know, they they were very interested in exploring other ways to create. And so shata in Arabic means, um, if I'm, if I'm, it's disruption or sort of um, breaking apart something. So shata is about going, kind of finding a new way to express um, creativity, not necessarily on in, in Western terms, because their teachers at this El Muftaha village, um, which was one of the only places to really, one of the few places to study art were from, were kind of teaching in a more Western style manner. So this was something that would just um, change. And again, they began creating um, art in a very conceptual, contemporary manner, using a lot of found objects. And they're not, they're all self-taught artists. I think that's really important to, to mention is that, you know, Mater, Ahmed Mater is a former physician. Abdel Nasser Ghadam is a um, lieutenant, lieutenant colonel. I think well, he's in, he was in the Saudi ar army. And they turned to art. And this was a way for them to make sense of some of the geopolitical events that I know affected me, like 9-11, and they affected you know, all of us. They sort of changed the course of history. I think for a lot of Saudis, as you pointed out in this book, and I think I've mentioned in the recent article I wrote to you, they were feeling also quite confused and, and sad too, because suddenly Saudi became, a lot of Saudis were seen in this negative light, of, of, understandably in some ways, because of it was just completely... No one quite understood what was going on. Um, and so as this one quote, um, there's a few very strong quotes in the book, I think from well, Ahmed Mater and Abdullah Sagadam, but the idea of that they turned to art, they turned to creativity to understand this, to make sense of the world and to express their feelings. Um, and so, and that sort of took on. And then there's this chance encounter with, which leads up to what Ali just was mentioning, you know, Edge of Arabia. Um, Stephen Stapleton is a real pioneer, um, a British Norwegian, and who happened to be in Al Muftaha village, you know, in 2003, I think the eve of the Iraq war, the US invasion of Iraq. And he kind of started hanging out with Abdel Nasser Gara, Ahmed Mader, and they formed Edge of Arabia. And that's obviously the group has changed a lot. But you have these sort of, um, you know, this first group of artists. And then over the years, um, galleries did. I mean, there were galleries there. there are, as we've mentioned in the book, there were some, you know, major galleries, a few different important shows. But Uther, Uther, um, Uther was founded in 2009. Then you have Hafez Gallery, um, um, Al-Mansuriya Foundation, Princess Jawahar. You have a lot of private institutions that I've also mentioned in the recent article I've you that you can find in the book that really were fundamental to where the art scene is today, which is very much um, state-led. But uh, yeah. And, also, and I think, you know, the use of the word institutions kind of as, as well that you're just discussing commercial galleries, but then also private foundations is that so many of these, uh, these incubating, they're, you know, incubators really in a way, and they all had to be many different things. You know, even today, Ather, you know, now has started Ather Foundation. Um, they have a residency program. That's not a normal commercial gallery. You know, that's not a Gagosian or a White Cube or a you know David's Werner model that we know um, in the Western sense. Um, and you know, Edge of Arabia had to be many different things to many people. Um, Montserrat Foundation, um, I think, started off really focusing a lot on Orientalist art, and then um, of course Princess Jawahar realized, you know, and actually through her great friendship with Sophia bin Zagar, so with the, this wonderful artist in Jeddah, in her hometown, um, realizing that there was a need to support artists that were living and working in the community. So, and then Uther for years when um, there was no other place to to hang out. And of course, you know, socializing um, in an integrated, you know, uh, mixed sex uh, back, uh, mixed sex workplace was, you know, almost quite difficult. Uther was a place that everyone who was interested in the arts could just go hang out. You know, mm -hmm. they could just exchange ideas and just be together and have a coffee and, and, you know, just be able to read books and, you know, spend time um, in that kind of setting. So everyone had to be very nimble and, you know, try to do many different things and, and for many different people. And Alia, can you speak a bit to um, how the scene, the kind of artists that, that emerged from that scene, I, uh, of course, some of the major ones have been mentioned here, Ahmed Matar and Abdul Nasser Haram, who of course held their own sort of salons as well that became very important too as incubators for the artists. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, their art and also how it was perceived? Um, you're more in touch sort of with the global kind of environment. Uh, how Saudi art was perceived by some of these earlier or more recent early pioneers? I think that, um, you know, when you, 
look, this is not just about Saudi art, but you look at Middle Eastern art in um, a Western context so often, it's very dismissed. And I often tell the story. So for whoever is in the audience who's heard this from me before, I'm sorry, but I just find it so indicative of really, frankly, an innate prejudice that is hopefully changing now and not just about Saudi, but about art from, you know, really anywhere of the the non-white Western world. Um, We were on an early trip uh, organized by Canvas uh, to Abu Dhabi uh, very early in the Saudi Island announcement days. And two prominent collectors, elderly American um, uh, elderly American collectors who are absolutely renowned. I mean, any person in this audience would recognize the name. They you know, came, so they were curious. So they were there on the trip. But then they just said, they're like, all of these artists, they're just so political. Can't they just make art that has just, you know, conceptual art that we understand? And I said, well, you know, if you look at artists and especially, you know, I think they were kind of examining a lot of the Lebanese artists that they were seeing. So like a Walid Rad or an Akram Zatari. Well, these artists grew up in a time of civil war. You know, you make art based on your life experiences. And, you know, if we look at a lot of, you know, post-war German artists, yes, of course, it's, you know, laden with, you know, uh, you know, conceptual art, but it's also about, you know, rebuilding Germany after the war, examining identity. I mean, you look at the United States, you know, abstract expressionists, like same, you know, it looks different, but it's still about art and context of society. So uh, I think it has, I really truly believe, and I'm completely biased, but I believe strongly in what the Tate has done um, because I'm very involved with Tate and I'm a founding member of the Middle East and North Africa Acquisitions Committee, Tate Modern Advisory Council, Tate Patron. Like I, you know, I think the Tate has changed the way the world sees art from, you know, outside of the white Western world. And I think when you saw Tate Modern open and you had art hung that was based on, you know, here's a room about the horrors of war and genocide. So you had a work about, you know, the pogroms and Eastern Europe next to a work about the massacre at Sabre and Shatila. And you're, you know, drawing humanity together and not about, oh, here's your you know, Asia room, you know, here's your Japan gallery or China gallery or, you know, indigenous room. And instead it's about, you know, how humanity comes together around universal concepts. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk a bit. Let's, uh, we, we've talked a bit about the scene, especially in Jeddah, I guess, which was the real center for art, Abha and Jeddah, um, to the more contemporary era with the state now coming in a really big way, because I think, you know, that's part of the reason why there's interest in having the book and everything is that Saudi Arabia is now becoming a, a, a bigger player. Um, Rebecca, how do you, can you tell us a bit about some of the initiatives and more importantly, on a strategic level, how the state is is understanding sort of its entry into this art sector, which is really something quite new, right? This is not something, as you said, a lot of these artists did not get any uh, support whatsoever and were sort of self-taught and, um, uh, you know, making their own way basically in the world through these uh, different initiatives. So what does that state entry look like? Um, well, you know, since um, since 2016, you have you have the introduction we haven't mentioned yet, of Vision 2030, which is really this um, incredible agenda, very ambi- very ambitious plan, uh, by MBS, um, Prime Minister and Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, as people know. And the idea is to wean, you know, the country off a reliance on on oil, which we've mentioned. Um, and what I found fascinating um, is that, you know, in in weaning off and creating this parallel economy that, you know, even though it is there, the economy is still very much um, dominant on hydrocarbons. Um, it's using that money from that it gets from hydrocarbons as well to invest in the arts and in this cultural push. But it's the idea that um, they truly believe in creativity. So this, uh, this idea, which which we speak about in the book of fostering a creative economy, um, comes comes with the idea that through this creative economy, you're actually going to create a parallel economy. So it's, it's through the arts, it's through something creative that um, by changing culture has the has the opportunity the ability to change people's minds to get them excited about you know new ideas entrepreneurship um and that's that's something that's always fascinated me i i i have two very um different interests i'm very interested in i've always you know i've i've always been interested in conflict resolution and geopolitics but i'm very much interested in culture and art and i believe that they can come together to to bring about change um even though we're living during extremely tumultuous times What is fascinating about what's happening in Saudi Arabia, which we really haven't seen before, um, 
is is this extreme investment of billions of dollars into the um, into you know culture art entertainment tourism basically the creative industries and this is not only fostering um it's not only bringing about you know hundreds of thousands of new jobs but it's also educating people saudis that haven't had these opportunities before you know it's important to underline that there really have not been any art schools in saudi arabia i mean you yes there were sort of more rudimentary um you know art courses and there's a lot of traditional craft which is wonderful which is something that's also being um you know also really brought to life again um and and shown to people who are visiting the kingdom but this this push um is in some ways um it, it's a way for the there's a there's a good quote in in there by um Ali Shihabi I think uh, he's a he's a political he's a um political commentator a Saudi political commentator and that this this push also for um, you know this new society, this new creative economy in Saudi is also a way for the regime to survive. It's also a way for Saudi to expand to to have a future. Um, you know, you wouldn't have Naom or any of the big giga projects, Studia. Um, I mean, I've been to so many different launches. If you didn't have a creative, you know, um, this creative push in your mind, um, and that's what's so amazing about the arts is that. Maybe you're not even an artist. Um, maybe you don't want to be necessarily a painter or, um, I don't know, a calligrapher or an installation artist or a filmmaker. But you might go to one of these exhibitions and think, oh, I might have an idea for a business or might do this or maybe I'll start a new architectural project. That's what I think is so incredible. Um, and so this this push, this investment um, has, as Ali will also say, has really resulted in a new is in the new Ministry of Culture, a variety of different ministries, um, Ministry of Culture, which has, I think, what was it 11 commissions? I, I want to make sure I get that right. Yes. 11 commissions, am among which are film, um, fashion, visual arts. There's even a culinary commission. So it's and what's amazing is that it's not just um I think through this and, and Alia um we can also speak about it because she's worked so she works so closely with the ministry is is it's 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 really um emphasizing you know Saudi heritage Saudi talents but through cultural dialogue so there's a real fusion every time I go to an art exhibition or any sort of um could be Didia any sort of launch in Saudi it's it's a real mix of um Saudi cultural Saudi talents with um with um people from abroad you know foreign um foreign voices and I think that that is something that they're really trying to um trying to achieve um so yes there's been and you have also have a Riyadh art um which is an entity um, again under the government but that's trying to beautify um further beautify Riyadh and do you know really um erect a lot of uh, public art around the city because that really hadn't you know there wasn't any public art before um and they have no Riyadh which is a huge light art festival which happened uh, last month um, there's, yeah, there's just a variety of this Alula as well, which is turning into a huge cultural destination. You know, they're really banking again on culture to sort of drive tourism. So culture is kind of, for me, it's, um, of course there is mining and, you know, there's a variety of other things that I've reported on that are crucial to Saudi's achievement, uh, achieving the vision 2030 aims, um, most definitely. But what is, um, culture is a big core of that. I think this create, this creative economy is a really big part of, um, of of the of the growth of the survival of of Saudi this building of a separate economy yeah yeah and I think you know on on that point it's also you know it's teaching people that you know these things don't have to be your hobby you know I knew so many of my friends in college um, and actually so many of the Saudi girls that were in Boston for example I was I was at school at Brown and went to, was in Boston often you know they would study graphic design because that was their only thing that they could think of that that would be something they could do creatively in Saudi and be able to make a living. You know, you, you couldn't really think that you would be an artist or, you you know, you couldn't think, you know, and even being an architect was, you know, very niche. Um, but yet graphic design was that was that outlet. And now, you know, people, so many people had started like baking companies at home, but never really thought, you know, about, you know, cafe culture was always something very prominent. But now it's booming because, of course, there's, you know, integration and, it, there's more of a, a feeling of mirth in the streets. You know, I went back um, with somebody who hadn't been back in about 10 years to Saudi and they came back in 2020. They're like, you hear music, people are joyful. And you didn't necessarily always feel that, especially when you went to Riyadh, it was very, you know, closed off and quiet. And, and in the public spaces. Yeah, in the public places. And, it, and there's now a sense of joy. Um, and, 
you know, I have done a lot of various, you know, kind of trips around the world to cultural destinations. So places like Naoshima, Marfa, um, but one that always has really struck me that in a strange way, very similar um, to what Rebecca was just saying about, you know, this teaching people how to be creative, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be an artist and that you can make a living out of it is in Bentonville, Arkansas, um, where the Walton family, of course, um, has the Crystal Bridges Museum and where, you know, the, you know, Walmart headquarters and various other Fortune 500 companies are. And in Bentonville, they built Crystal Bridges and they made it free and open to the public. And they also have a very, very serious schools program because it's the only cultural institution for something like a 40 mile square radius. And they bus in all of these kids and they did a study with the University of Arkansas, completely independent, not not uh, sponsored or paid for by by um, Walmart, that the children who had gone through Crystal Bridges and who had gone through their school program were doing better in school, in math, in history, in other subjects, because they were taught to look at things in a different way by looking at art. And I think, you know, you definitely see uh, the resonance of those types of studies and what's happening in Saudi now is that people are being taught that they can be something else than, you know, an engineer or whatever they thought was the only path chosen for them before. Yeah. Um, thank you for it's good to bring in, I think, some of those other comparisons to to understand that, you know, this is a, Saudi Arabia is not unique and 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 trying to um uh, create this sort of change uh, within society and almost sort of strategically. Um, I was really struck by some of the quotes that you had in there, Rebecca, too, of the urgency that some of the artists feel at this current moment. I I really like this one a description you had of the artist uh, Nugamshi, who's uh, kind of entering in one of his artworks, I guess it's entitled Sarab, where it says that, it, I'm just going to quote you actually, um, against the endless arid landscape of the harsh Saudi Arabian desert, a man in a white thobe, the traditional Saudi male dress, approaches the camera swiftly with fierce determination, almost as if his life depended on it. He carries with him a paintbrush dripping with crude oil. An eerie feeling of violence fills the scene as the man, which is the Saudi artist, Ugamshi, takes his paintbrush and after making a few calligraphic marks, smashes the glass in his painting. Um, can you tell us, I mean, that you're kind of using that to illustrate the sort of urgency and the willingness to really shake things up that comes with uh, the Vision 2030. Um, can you tell me a bit more about how that shaping the work of the artists themselves sort of trying to work with the state in these new ways? No, thanks. And I'm really glad you like that description because I also, I also really love, I really I love that artwork. I don't know what Nugamshi is up to at the moment, but he that really struck me. That was 2019, and Moeth Alofi, who's a Saudi artist and curator, um, staged this in Jeddah. And yeah, I was one. Of, it was a really, really good exhibition. Um, I think in terms of urgency, yes, I've and that's something I've said to I've discussed with other journalist colleagues, you know, in in Riyadh, that there's just this the feeling in the air of like we got to get this done before it's too late. We have to seize the moment, and you have to remember that as we both have said, like a few years ago, there really wasn't, things were closed, you know, men and women could not gather freely. Um, we, You've gone, you know, you've literally, it's almost like a bomb has gone off. I mean, I, I'm always a little bit delicate when I discuss this too, because publicly things were closed, but as a lot of Saudi artists, or Saudi DJs, for example, you know, the last few years I've, I've attended a, a Middle Beast, which is a huge electronic mu music festival, and there's amazing, I love electronic music, there's amazing Saudi DJs, and one um um Baloo, one of them, one of he once told me and he said, he said, This is just a great unveiling. We've always been like this. We were just doing it, you know, underground. <laughs> um and yes, in many ways it is, but going back to this urgency, which I find in music, I find in the art, is is this desire to kind of, you know, to show not just each other, to have this moment to really embrace it, but also to kind of be a bit. In some ways, I feel kind of more understood and by the world. I think they they felt it, you know, a lot. There's been a lot of misunderstanding, misinterpretations, as we know, due to a lot of uncomfortable, uncomfortable events. Um, and um, and I think that there's a. I, I do feel not only the fact that yes, um, you know, oil, oil. There's there's this whole perception that maybe oil is running out. Oil isn't running out, but it's a very volatile market, as you know. I'm sure you're also economic <laughs> reporters, or specialists will will tell you. Um, 
And so with that validity is the desire to also get some stability too. Of course, oil will probably eventually run out, but um, this is this idea is to, you know, to create this art, to, to do this, to have this moment that they haven't had a chance you know, to really have their voices heard at home or abroad. I mean, there's very few. Edge of Arabia was revolutionary in terms of really um, casting um, a light, you know, shining a light on what was happening in Saudi Arabia. I mean, they had events in London at the Venice Biennial. People had no idea that there were artists um, in the kingdom. I mean, they, um, but I think now this this urgency, um, yeah, to to kind of do this again before it's, there's this feeling in the air. And as, as I've also mentioned in the book that, um, I don't know that there's this 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 time won't come back. I think there's some of the artists told me again, we don't know. And I don't pretend to know what the Saudi Arabia the art scene is going to look like in 10 years. Um, there's no way I can know. Um, I'm not a fortune teller, I'm just a journalist. But but this idea that there's investment right now and we don't know what will happen tomorrow. Um, I think also so socioeconomically, we don't know what will happen. Um, but I think there's some, I love that work in particular because the idea of smashing kind of the oil is that they feel, and I mean, um, there's a quote from Akhman Mater in the beginning of the book too, of this, this crazy oil civilization, which has, um, which has influenced the way we, we live, we do everything in our, in our life here in Saudi is this idea of smashing this oil as a way of, of saying that this isn't who we are. We are also something different. We are, our identity is not just defined by, by the oil wealth that has, that has quite frankly shaped the country. It's shaped its geopolitics. It's shaped a lot of the mentality. I had it for a long time, like a lot of the Gulf states, I had a rontier state mentality. It's strange. It's interesting because you don't hear that rontier state term being used as much. When I was in graduate school for Middle Eastern studies, that would you studied. Uh, you studied a course okay. on rontier state. You used to hear it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. you don't. Um, but this idea of smashing that for me was it gave me goosebumps. And I included that in the book. And I really wanted to keep that description because I felt it was so um. Yeah, it's so palpable to to they it's almost like he wants or some of these artists, they want to be seen um separate from the current events um that continue to shape um the identity of this nation. And I think um, you know, event, you know, the Duria Biennial is coming up in a few weeks. There's Alula, there's Desert X. Every time the last few years, I've covered so many of them and I've been very privileged to have been able to and been invited to cover to cover these events, but there's been um, there's been mixed reactions on both sides of the world, the East and the West. Um, and us journalists sometimes are, or cult cultural practi practitioners, curators are often put in the very, in a very uncomfortable, well, difficult position. And the artists themselves too. You know, I have, there's one article I wrote for Artnet and I've included the quote in the book, my Mohanad Shono, who represented um, Saudi at the Venice Biennial um, two years ago, um, saying the last, the first Desert X, you know, there was a lot of criticism from from artists, from curators in America, particularly California, for some reason, who, well, California, that's where Desert X was founded, um, who did, who had never even been to the kingdom. A lot of criticism of why you're holding the event in Saudi. And Mohanad um, told me, he said, we are not, you know, I'm not, a pro we are not propaganda machines. We are creating art um, for art. We're not told what to create. So I think, again, going back to I the urgency. the attention that many of those critics, I think all of the critics, and especially in that, that moment, had never even been to Saudi Arabia. And we're just absolutely criticizing from a complete point of ignorance. Yeah, so I think the urgency is, as 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 you were saying, Kristen, and these works. I mean, Akhman Mater, a lot of his works. Beginning, there's that really famous one with the the um, X-ray and the oil. Um, yeah. What do you call it? Yeah, <laughs> the oil, yeah. oil oil station, and you know, it's all, and it looks like a man putting a gun to his head. It's again this idea that my gosh, they discovered oil, and it's it shaped our entire identity and culture and influenced, you know, who we are. Um, and I think art is this incredible vehicle to not only to study a country or culture's, you know, socioeconomics and what's happening to document. Sometimes I feel art artists sometimes document better what's happening than even I do in words. It depends on what you want to read and what kind of information you want to find. Um, but it's, it's again, an urgency to be seen, you know, separate to some of the stereotypes, um, that continue, that, that persist on, on both sides. Um, and that's one reason I, we wrote this book, I think, is to, to help forge, um, a stronger understanding of what's happening today. Yes, I think what's, what's confusing and that might, I don't know if this is a follow-up question or Vali wants to jump in, but there's been a lot of concern concern predominantly from the international community, predominantly from the West of this massive state, you know, funding for the arts and the culture is, you know, 
as if that's somehow somehow a way to control um, cultural production. And we have analyzed that in the book. Um, and you don't have that same level of investment now in the UK and the US. In fact, there's there's sort of a, a lessening, a decrease of investment. Um, I don't know if Alia wants to take over on, on that, but that's, I think some of this urgency again comes, comes with wanting to be understood, wanting to be seen for who they are and um and also to kind of break free of this of this identity i think that's been kind of cast upon them if that if that makes sense mm. yeah I, I mean i think i'm uh, sorry ali i just wanted to mention we are getting some questions and i i hadn't said anything but please uh, people that you can you're welcome to put your uh questions in the q a um as well, we'll be happy to be getting to some of those which look like they're uh, running right along well with our conversation. Um, if I could, Ali, I want you to speak to that, but I, I did want to mention that in the book, you are quite frank as well in, in discussing, though, uh, some of the difficulties of the environment in Saudi Arabia, you know, mentioning that this is a state where there's um, it's an authoritarian state. I mean, we, we know that in some sense uh, from the leadership. Um, that it's very centralized, the power, and, th and that there are red lines that these artists need to negotiate. Um, and um, I thought it was interesting. You you had some quotes, though, about how, and I'm, I'm very curious what you think about how the artists navigate that. Um, you did have one quote uh, from the artist kind of saying that this is the sort of thing that everybody has to to understand and to do uh, deal with. I think it was Muhammad Al-Faraj who says, I believe in the old way of maneuvering and viewing metaphors and symbols, these are the tools of poetry and of code. Institutions in the society are more tolerant if you speak in metaphors than in symbolism. So I guess in some ways that speaks to art has always been able to uh, navigate different environments wherever they find themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, d definitely. And you, you see that, you know, Mohamed Al-Faraj and, and many of the artists um, of this generation in particular are much more comfortable talking about that and saying that they they know that they actively, you know, do that. And if you want to be harsh about it, you can say, oh, that's self-censorship. But in fact, I wouldn't say that it's censorship at all. It's a way um, that as an artist, they want to communicate and they want their work to be seen and to be uh, embodied and imbued with those values. And, you know, many of the artists are you know, every artist I talk to, and I've talked to many of them, and with especially in the context of the Biennale, you know, we've had all of the major Saudi artists, um, and now our upcoming third edition, um, you know, second edition of the contemporary, but third of, of produced by the Biennale Foundation. And the artists are all so excited and proud, and they do want to be a part of the change, and they know that they're you know pushing boundaries, and they are you know talking about you know difficult subjects, but they also know that by you know just that little push forward that does help with the evolution i mean the first biennale was called feeling the stones um you know and rebecca has also written a wonderful article a series of wonderful articles about that and really examining that because it comes from you know saying at the time of you know great change in china of crossing the river by feeling the stones you don't really know what's coming next but you know that this is a moment of urgency of change and uh the artists like Manal Doyan with many of her early works, you know, the the uh, prayer beads, the pearls of the prayer beads with uh, the matrilineal lines, with the pigeons about, you know, women not being able to travel without male uh, permission. You know, all of those things, um, you know, now seem, well, the, the permissions is, you know, extinct, you know, no longer do you need that, obsolete. And the matrilineal line, you know, you ask any, you know, American, she just did, uh, made a performance slightly based on that. And uh, at the Guggenheim, it was the most visited performance in the rotunda of last year. And that was because it also spoke to a global audience. Not many Westerners can name their matrilineal line. Um, so I, I think that a lot of these issues are, you know, what artists think that they are doing to help change and make a progressive change in society. And I see that we have a couple of questions. For example, um, uh, the most recent was about uh, who are the intended audience and what's the reception um, among Saudis. I mean, Saudis are 99.99% of the population unbelievably excited by what is happening. And you see the amount of people, um, you know, the audience numbers that attend, you know, the Biennale, uh, Nur Riyadh. And, you know, many of these festivals are also, you know, different types of art for different people. You know, so you have different definitions of you know, public art um, or let's say art that's in an international context, but 
you know, people are just hungry for knowledge and you have, you know, many volunteers. Um, and so at the Biennale, we had uh, a lot of students or let's say younger volunteers who were our uh, you know, guides and docents. And they were just thirsty to, to learn and to be able to give these tours and were frankly devastated on the last day thinking that they didn't have this kind of outlet because you yet don't have, you know, major museums open. Of course, we know they're all opening. Um, and, you know, the investment in that is is huge and it's coming quickly, but it's not yeah. there yet. Can you speak? That's one of the questions we have from uh, Avery Coleman. Um, asked to, you know, we've talked about the urgency and the huge speed of transformation, but asked Rebecca if you can give a more tangible sense of the scale and pace within the arts in terms of museums, biennales, venues, heritage sites, financial support, um, and your thoughts about experiencing that dynamic, which I think you've gone into somewhat, but can you give us just a little bit more tangible uh, sense yeah. of that scale and pace? And, and some well, of I, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, no, I I am, um, I feel that there's been an increase in momentum since for the last um, five, six years that I've been, you know, doing much more work and reporting in, in the kingdom. I'm the last like month, um, two months, November, December. I mean, I was there almost every week and the pace is really tangible. I mean, it's just, I, I can't, sometimes I feel like I'm on like a, a jet plane constantly, like going from place to place. There's people are extremely excited. Um, you know, I, I, I know Saudis and well, I'm obviously commenting on the cultural field, but they're working night and day to, to, um, to create these events. There's, there's almost, I mean, there's just a huge amount happening all at the same time. Um, you know, they just, you know, Saudi Arabia, when I, when I was there for Noria, they had just won, you know, Expo 2030, which is a huge event, um, which is, I think Riyadh will obviously change, um, after that win. But yeah, the tangible sense of the scale and the pace is, is like something I've never seen before. And Dubai has often been considered as this fast forward, like, you know, come almost like futuristic city, which it very much is. But I've never sensed this type of, I, you literally get off the plane and it's just, I hit the ground running. And it's not just because I'm, of course, you know, the life of a journalist or even Alia has, we all have busy, hectic schedules, but there's a real... I don't know, drive um, from the minute you're helped at the airport often, it depends on what type of trip I'm I'm there covering. Um, people are just, they're just really, you know, fast paced to help you from one place to the next. Um, and yes, there are, there obviously are challenges. I think that sometimes I, I sense and artists have told me that they're so excited. They really want to take hold of this moment. You know, as Alia rightly said, feeling the stones, you don't know what's going to be tomorrow, but you want to take hold of it, get the opportunity, seize the day, carpe diem. But they're also tired. It's it's there's there's also exhaustion because there's so much happening all at once and they haven't had this. So you've gone from almost nothing to just, you know, um 180 um all at the same time. Yeah, in terms of museums, biennials, ven venues, heritage site, I mean, there's a huge, there's tons and tons of museums that are in the works. I don't at the moment there's just a lot of announcements. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but um, I know Alia, are you working with the Ministry of Culture? Are you working in on some of the museums and these sorts of um, things? Less like tangentially, um, you know, kind of helping, um, you know, kind of provide partnerships and introductions to uh, people who are experts in, you know, collecting um, and creating, you know, uh, public collections. Of course, um, collecting for a public institution is very different than a private collector. And um, I'm very involved with the Biennale in particular and with international partnerships on that. Um, I just wanted to actually address, I think, a couple of the questions um, are you know, quite pointed. And I think the way in which they would like to create an avenue for criticism. And I would want to say to the anonymous attendee who asked, all is, art is all about free expression. Why should artists work in a country? Well, that's a question for the artists. And I think, you know, we have demonstrated here and in the book that the Saudi artists overwhelmingly want to be in Saudi and working in their country. And, you know, Rebecca has answered this question in multiple articles with multiple quotes and has just uh, repeated some here. Um, I know this from my experience um, with the artists working at the Biennale who are Saudi, and they believe deeply in the change and being a part of the change, that their work is a part of that change that has created freedoms and has opened their country up for themselves and to others. And, um, you know, the other question, money can't buy culture. Would all of this have happened if there wasn't such a huge budget? Well, I ask you to please listen to the beginning of this podcast and please read the book. Um, there was no budget from the kingdom in the early days when the artists were working. And we have demonstrated that 
there is a, a serious artistic scene of native born Saudis, of people who are artists from the kingdom and who were not working with a huge budget, who are not from wealthy families, who are not um, at all, you know, just financed to flit around and be an artist, but people who are committed to their craft. So the budget now coming in, um, if anything, is is incredible, but it's also providing its own pressures because there are these huge projects and huge large scale projects that some of these artists aren't prepared for, you know, because they are working in small studios and working to create, you know, let's say paintings or work that you have behind me here or in craft. Um, and then the first question, um, the state of Saudi Arabia came together from a group of different societies with different traditions. And can we comment about how it's spread around the kingdom? Absolutely. I mean, you see very different um, types of work created, uh, you know, across the kingdom. And, you know, you especially, I think, have seen that with a lot of the idea of craft and what is the difference between craft as opposed to art. And you hear that um, kind of universally around the art world and especially in the context of um, female artists, because so often female artists, even in a Western context, were working in traditional uh, artistic forms that people considered craft. Um, you know, even talking about somebody like a Louise Bourgeois, or Rosemary Trockle, who, you know, turned this around by using knitting and, and different uh, forms of a more female way of making things. Um, so yeah, I think just for the ease of saying this, you know, we call it Saudi art and we're talking about Saudi Arabia as one country. But when you do want to go down to the nitty gritty and you have now, of course, some books coming out, so like Crafts of a Kingdom and some of the books coming, um, you know, from the ministry and other organizations, they will talk more specifically about how art um, is different between each of the regions. And that is also now going to be a very important aspect of art history that people um, examine moving forward. Let me go into uh question. Uh, thank you for moving through um, a lot of those questions, Alia. Uh, but we had one that I think kind of speaks to this issue of the outward facing Saudi Arabia, which clearly the Saudis are trying to use art to attract and to send a message about what Saudi Arabia is in this current day, but also the inward facing, um, because of course, artists are working on both of those things and the Saudi transformation is working in both ways. So Nazar Halal, um, who's from the Gulf Studies Center and Qatar University says, what are the platforms and mediums that can assist artists in aligning their artistic expression with the cultural and religious values of society while engaging in a constructive dialogue, both with the state and society, uh, rather than being in conflict? I think there's kind of an implication of uh, that there are some types of art that would be in conflict. So I think I the Islamic know. arts Biedale is by, you know, that. yeah, that would be the number one in terms of religion with culture. The Islamic mm -hmm. Arts Biennale um, is, you know, very much at the heart of that. You know, it is about discussing Islam in a cultural context, Islam, uh, of course, as a religion, um, but Islam also as a platform for artistic expression. So, you know, I'm sure there are, are many more in the pipeline, but really for me, the Islamic Arts Biennale was a transformative experience um, and really uh, reshaping that narrative and um, absolutely without conflict. I mean, I'll, I'll, yeah, I would add, just add to that to say that, yeah, I, I, I yes, um, the Islamic arts biennial had, you know, had never been done before. I mean, it didn't have to have it in Jeddah close to, you know, the, um, close to Mecca, you know, really in the gateway of, of Mecca um, was, was quite revolutionary. You know, uh, the at Middle East, um, it, it you know, religion is such a part of the history and the culture and the society. It's um, and there are there are obviously a lot of contradictions that come to play, and and it is and it is complex. It makes it makes the art complex. I mean, I think in other countries, in my own country, which you know, America, there are also, or in other places, there are also contradictions in another manner. But I think the contradictions that you find and the complexities are, as Nazar pointed out, you know, sort of this this concoction between um, you know, religion and um, you know, how, how to create freely, um, you know, in, in, um, in these contexts. And I think what's happening in Saudi is that there are, there are ways that are, are being found. And I, I just wanted to kind of, you know, adding on to that and also in answer to a few other questions that, you know, people are saying, you know, one of the people are talking about freedom of expression in, in, in sort of an autocratic regime. And I, we did try, um, very hard to answer that in the book. Um, it's challenging because I think, 
um, you know, growing up, if you if you grow up in the West, you there is this idea that the liber, you know, a liberal democracy, do, democracy, you know, where you have a complete freedom of expression, which I'm not sure that's debatable right now, but we're not going to get into what's happening um, in the U.S. and other parts of the world. Um, but that's the way that people have sort of criticized or looked upon Saudi Arabia, that without a liberal democracy, there cannot be an art scene or there cannot be a, a you know, a cultural scene. Um, so you end up kind of looking at, at you know, at, at forms and types of government. Um, you know, in Tanari, I've quoted here, um, you know, I'll just to quote part of this passage from the book, you know, although it is common currency in the West, the countries need a liberal democracy to have free and vibrant, to have a free and vibrant creative scene. Tanari argues that this is not always the case, and it isn't. There was a time when we looked at art and forward thinking cultural expression happening in non-democratic places as a prelude to a teleo teleological political change towards a democratic system, but meaningful cultural production and meaningful urban culture is happening in contexts that are not um, elective democracies. And I think this is this is difficult. I think mentally for a lot of um, a lot of us that have grown up. Um, I am saying us because I, I did I did grow up in the U.S. and I have you know studied in that system and and I understand it. Um, but to to accept and that there could be another way of doing things. There could be a way to express yourself or to to have a cultural scene that is not necessarily an adherence or within a political regime that is exactly like ours. Um, you know, the Gulf states, what's happening and in Saudi Arabia show that there is another way that is possible. Yes, there are challenges. Um, you know, I've been, I look at a lot of the questions. I agree that there, there are still challenges um, to overcome. And I think that we are literally at the beginning. I mean, Kristen, you pointed out in your quotes when I interviewed you for the book that you need to also put this in context with the fact that five or six years ago, there really wasn't any of this. So you've just literally had, um, you know, uh, in, you know, integration, men and women can gather freely in public. I mean, this is extremely new. Um, there's no more Motawa religious beliefs. Um, you know, women don't have to cover, I mean, but they can cover and a lot of them cover their, it's their choice. And so it's, it's, you need to, whatever is, is happening now and, um, you need to put this in context of a completely different culture, a completely different history. Um, and, um, and political system, but that doesn't mean that art is not creative. It doesn't mean that the art is is not expressive, and it doesn't mean that the art is not meaningful, and it doesn't mean that the art doesn't capture um, what's happening in society and in politics. Uh, I I was extremely drawn to Saudi art because it is so poignant, because it is so powerful, because the messages are so acute, they're so edgy, you know. I um they're so disruptive. Um, they're so in some ways rebellious. Mohammed Hafiz, you know. He is another, he, in an interview years ago for Artnet, um, he told me that in some ways the restrictions helped to create good, good art. So in some ways having those restrictions kind of made the artists, you know, gave them impetus to also discuss, found, find interesting ways to, um, to discuss these topics. And so it's really, it's really intellectual looking at some of this, some of this, these, um, this art, you know, from Manal Duane's from the, oh gosh, I just, I totally forgot the name of the artwork you were talking about, Alia, the birds, the, the doves, um, yeah. Um, yeah, but there's there's these artists are going, they are breaking the boundaries to talk about some real issues in, in the society um, that I think would be surprising for um, for, um, you know, Western critics. And they're doing it within. And yes, it is an autocratic regime. Things are changing at a rapid rate. Um, it is confusing. Um, it, it's, it is it is a time of utter change, which means that there is confusion. There is, um, you know, um, uncertainty in some ways, which I also bring about in the book, but, um, and transforming, yeah. you know, I think absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, we've actually gone beyond the time. Um, we've tried to reach uh, a lot of the questions uh, and some people have sent some, some comments and also some, uh, thanks and gratitude for the two of you for writing this book, um, and wrestling with this and trying to understand the place of art um, in, in a Saudi Arabia, which is changing quite dramatically. So I'm really thrilled that we were able to host both of you and to have this discussion. Um, I wanted to mention to those of you who are um, uh, watching first, uh, please do look at the, the blog that um, Rebecca uh, gave to us. That's to analysis of private art institutions and, and their role in Saudi's art evolution. Um, please do look to their book. It's it's a really interesting read. I think it has a lot of voices of a lot of uh, Saudi artists themselves, um, and also puts it in this in this context and a lot more information about the new uh, institutions and initiatives. 
And please do look to um, our work as well. We we have uh, we're investing a lot more in this this sphere at, at the Arab Gulf States Institute. Uh, Nada Magui is a new cultural associate who's going to be dedicating her time to um, to arts as well as um, some of these social issues and trends. Um, and she's established a new culture column that's going to highlight a lot of the work that we're doing, and that really has a way to highlight another way to highlight uh, voices of. Of, that are working within these different fields. Um, so I encourage you all to, to look to that too, in addition to buying the book. So again, thank you, um, both of you. And thank you all of you for joining the conversation.